Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to have you all with us this afternoon. Please do settle in, make yourselves comfortable. We have a rather full agenda for the next hour that we're here together. Uh, so we're going to make a really prompt start. I hope that that's okay with everybody, just so that we can get through everything we've planned and hopefully finish on time. Um, so a really very warm welcome to today's webinar, um, an introduction to the Integrating Our Mental and Physical Healthcare Systems Project, otherwise known as the IMPS Project. My name is Gracie Tregett, and as the project manager for IMPS, it really is my great privilege to be in a position to guide you through today's webinar. Just a few things that I need to set out before we begin. Uh, for anyone that is unfamiliar with us and the work that we do, IMPS is an innovative three-year Maudsley charity funded project and delivered as part of the Mind and Body Programme at King's Health Partners. As an academic health science centre, the work that we do strives to understand how we can translate cutting edge research and existing best practice into excellent patient care. And we do that by working really closely in collaboration with our partners at South London and Maudsley, King's College Hospital, Guy's and St Thomas's, Royal Brompton, Old Airfield and King's College London. IMPS is one of many projects within the King's Health Partners portfolio, but it's one that we're immensely proud of. IMP sits within a programme of work focused on ways to integrate mind and body care, but with a very specific remit. And that's to understand how we can improve physical health interventions to support the lives of adults living with serious mental illness. Through our work, we hope to contribute to advancements in clinical research and practice that can support organisations and their staff to provide more complete whole person care to service users and ultimately readdress the mortality gap. So it's important for me to say that today's webinar is in fact the first in a series of six that will look to showcase the outcomes and learning from our portfolio of work over the last three years. This series is an opportunity for us to invite you to hear firsthand how we have worked together as a partnership, a partnership that has involved clinicians, academics, project managers and experts by experience, a project that has sought to identify research, test and trial interventions that could enhance how mental health services approach physical health care in routine practice. And that's why your attendance today is really so important to us as we hope to be able to offer opportunities to reflect on and discuss what we've done. And really, we hope to be able to go even further than that and speak and think with you as a community of people and professionals in practice as well. Today's session, of course, as I said just at the start, is an introduction. So we hope it really will serve as an overview to who we are and what we do. But more than that, we really hope that our work resonates with you in some form and offers ideas that you can take back into your lives, communities and organisations beyond today. So for this introductory webinar today, obviously, we have a rather full agenda. But I'm really delighted to say that we're going to be joined by colleagues from across King's Health Partners who have supported the project over the last three years. As you can see, we've got presentations, we have a panel discussion and at, time, um, at the end for a Q&A. So hopefully plenty of opportunity for you to hear from us and to contribute with your own questions as well. I should say we'd very much like to encourage this to be as interactive a session as possible today. And I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to make sure that the chat function is working well for you. So do take a moment to let us know where you're from and perhaps what interested you in joining us here today. We'd love to know who's in the room with us. And we really welcome your comments, reflections and reactions as we're going through today's session as well. This is an opportunity for me to introduce Henry Lockyer, who uh, is from the KHP comms team. He's really kindly uh, coming on screen there. Hi, Henry. Uh, and he'll be kindly monitoring the chat, responding to your comments and sharing your questions throughout the webinar today. It's important for me to say the webinar today is recorded. Um, and as you can see, as such, cameras and microphones are automatically set to mute. Uh, but if you feel unable to participate live with us for any reason, please don't worry. We will be in touch following the webinar with details how you can join us uh, if you've missed us live. Uh, and also we've got details on our future sessions coming up in the weeks ahead. So without further ado, um, I'd really now like to uh, move us forward uh, with our first item uh, this afternoon, and I'd like to invite Dr. Sean Cross uh, to join us, um, and he's now going to be sharing with us his reflections uh, on the IMPS project and doing so in his capacity as Clinical Director for the Mind and Body Programme at King's Health Partners. 
Thanks very much, Gracie, uh, for um, such a, a lovely um, introduction to what I hope is going to be um, a fantastic series um, of webinars um, over the next few um, weeks and months. Um, as Gracie mentioned, um, I am Clinical Director of the Mind and Body Programme. Um, I think I know many people um, on the list that I can see, but not everyone. And if you don't know me, um, it's very nice to meet you. Um, I am a consultant psychiatrist um, by background and um, offer clinic. My clinical practice is based at King's College Hospital um, in the emergency department and across the medical and surgical pathways um, in that hospital. But I'm an employee of South London and the Maudsley. And I suppose it's in that that link, that split between different organisations that um, highlights and epitomises all the um, challenges and difficulties that there can be offering really good high quality care for patients as patients do things that um, um, are perfectly normal, which is cross boundaries and cross structures and cross organizations um, in order to receive care for their mental and physical health, because we have this um, incredibly peculiar and very challenging system of um, thinking very much about mind and body very separately. I'm sure preaching to the converted with everyone um, on this call just now. But the whole point of the Mind and Body program is to work out ways that we can reduce those um, systemic barriers, we can reduce those challenges. Um, and of course, a lot of that work is about you know, building different systems and working out how you know, different pathways can work better and how we should be offering services better. But at the end of the day, it's also about a sort of bottom up groundswell of healthcare professionals who think that it's actually really important that we all offer better holistic overall care to people um, because it's offering care to people that is the most important thing and fired us all in our determination to go to medical school, nursing school, physio school, psychology, undergrad or whatever uh, the beginning of our um, journey into becoming a healthcare um, professional was all about. And so, as Gracie mentioned, we've got um, an array of different programs and projects, and we're probably more used to talking about the stuff that we do, the programs that we have in a general hospital setting, um, uh, which is why I'm absolutely delighted that we've got a focus in this and the subsequent five webinars around the the yang to that yin, the opposite way round of thinking about things, which is enhancing physical care for those people with chronic long term mental health challenges and issues. Um, and we're going to hear all about that today um, from an array of different people who have both been involved in offering services as part of the IMPS program, um, um, as well as people who have um, been very uh, instrumental in um, ensuring that the work that has been going on is embedded and systematized and made normal and made real for future generations of uh, patients. We have this appalling stat that many people on this call will know that there is this mortality gap. If you have um, a severe and enduring mental health problem, like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and many others, then people in our population, in our communities, die somewhere between 15 and 20 years earlier than those who don't have that condition. Um, and it's really important that we do something about that. This is a social justice issue as well as a healthcare integration um, issue. And part of the remit of the IMPS program has been to try and raise the bar, to try and push more, to try and look for different ways that we in this Academic Health Science Centre of King's Health Partners can keep pushing the debate and pushing what we're doing to help this group of people in our communities. Um, I won't go into significant details about the different work streams because that is going to occur next from Ray, uh, but all it uh, remains for me to do is to say thank you very much to everyone for putting this webinar on. Thanks much more 
to those who've attended and please do as Gracie said take part in the chat or ask questions um, and just as we get going with this webinar series just an enormous thanks to everyone hundreds of people over the past couple of years who have been instrumental in hopefully making this program a real flagship program and such a worthwhile endeavor um, so uh, with that in mind I'm going to hand over to Ray to give you the nuts and bolts and the real details about what IMPS has been all about for the last couple of years. Thanks very much indeed. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Sean. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I've uh, I've now got the uh, opportunity to, uh, well, slightly daunting task actually of uh, condensing nearly four years of project delivery into about five minutes. Um, and uh, I'd say that's no uh, small feat really for a project that really is a program in its own right. Um, but uh, when I was thinking about how to do this, I decided to explain more about how we'd uh, approach the project um, and then uh, uh, I'll finish with what we've actually done. So starting uh, at the beginning seemed sensible. I think it's worth mentioning that in the um, original bid to the Maudsley charity, which was for three years work, uh, there was an ambitious plan that was set out to, um, in its own words, work alongside the um, the trust physical health strategy to really pump prime the, um, the, the healthcare offer, the physical healthcare offer at SLAM. And the bid established the three areas uh, for improvement that would eventually become our uh, work streams. Uh, and they were pathways, um, health champions, and the potential of digital. But I think um, the challenge when uh, we started, when projects start, uh, but potentially for any project really, is that uh, the context for delivering ambitious plans changes uh, because of organizational development. Um, and when Ellie, uh, our first project manager, when I started um, as the, the nurse lead and Julie, our research lead, I think the, the way we worked in the early days was very much based on um, what we could learn, um, how we connected with colleagues, um, how we used examples of good practice in the local setting, uh, really trying to understand uh, why things that were already in place um, weren't necessarily working and um, really beginning as well to uh, kind of build and strengthen uh, relationships uh, with our team and, and the wider organisation. Uh, and I'm talking not just in SLAM here, although we were hosted by SLAM, but, but across King's Health Partners and really beyond um, uh, as well. Uh, and without realising necessarily just how much the, the, the building and, and strengthening of relationships would benefit and um, strengthen our efforts. Um, it wasn't just a free for all though. Um, you know, we didn't just go far well we did go far and wide but um uh, we approached that uh, using knowledge from implementation science to guide us um and also to hone uh, our approach but um important not to be too wedded to any particular framework or, or or model or process um and because we weren't too wedded to it or informed by it it meant that we were able to be adaptive um we've been able to step away from uh, things that seemed really good ideas, um, but that we didn't necessarily have confidence uh, that the time was right, or uh, perhaps that we were even the right team to, to drive this idea forward. An example of this, which I, I still find fascinating is uh, back in 2019, early days, uh, SLAM had already uh, purchased ahead of uh, other organizations the license uh, which enabled us to use Microsoft 
teams. Um, and so one of our very first projects was going out and trying to get people to uh, use this thing called Microsoft Teams, explaining what it was. And, and um, you know, we were suggesting it would be great because you'd be able to do remote consultations. It would be a, a way of bringing in carers and family members that otherwise wouldn't be able to attend, uh, you know, uh, conversations with uh, loved ones, with, with the people uh, from the families that were in hospital. And we just could not get any buy-in. Um, we really struggled, um, you know. And so we we stepped away. And a year later, the pandemic. And you know, who who knew that that's what it, it needed? Uh, I guess to uh, to get it over the line. But I, I also think where we've not progressed with things, um, we still have been able to to support others to make changes, and that's important too, because we've been able to to contribute to lots of of other other projects. Um, uh, clinical and research discussions and um, share the learning that we, we picked up along the way um, so that, as I say, even if we weren't leading on things, we could still help to drive forward the ambitions. And the, the latter webinars, um, you know, we won't cover all of those things, but the, a couple of examples are uh, improving access to two-week weight pathways or uh, bite-sized training. Um, and, and you probably won't hear about those again, but if you are interested in anything else about IMPS, please do get in contact. I think um, another thing I should uh, highlight as well is the, um, the strength that the project team had uh, in that it brought together uh, project management skills, clinical leadership and uh, research expertise, um, which really helped us to give a very considered approach to the issues that we tried to overcome. Uh, as a nurse joining this project back in 2019, I think that was the biggest change for me to actually have the thinking time that, uh, that was required to really plan out um, what we, we were trying to deliver. And, and also the thinking time as we've gone along to reflect um, because we've continued to constantly challenge ourselves. Why, you know, why do we do things in a particular way? Why is something important? Uh, who is it important uh, to or who is important for? Um, and, and going back to the, the piece I mentioned about context, that, that's obviously, again, something that's changed and why we've done that, because we've worked through a pandemic. Um, the, the physical health lead at SLAM that we've reported to has changed uh, four or five times uh, since we started. Uh, the, the hospital sites, the community teams, that they've changed. They've evolved. Tran transformation projects have gone on. Um, I'm running out of time. So I, I just want to mention one more aspect of the project that I feel really has made it what it is, and that's how we've worked with our experts by experience. Um, and, and that's, uh, in, I, I mean, when I say that, all, all the people, uh, the service users, the carers, the clinicians, the researchers that have given their uh, expertise and experience uh, and time to help shape the project. Um, I think we would have had a very different output if it weren't for them uh, all working with us at, at various points. Uh, and they have worked with us and we've progressed. Uh, we've tried to do more in terms of uh, how we've collaborated and co-worked because, you know, we see and we have seen firsthand how, how it made a difference. So what have we actually done? Well, on the screen, um, you, you'll see uh, a, a number of projects there. I think we've ended up with a host of different things, uh, some research projects, some service evaluation, some uh, kind of clinical uh, pathway and development work. Uh, the ones on screen are, are probably the ones that, or the larger piece of work that we've delivered. Um, Consultant Connect is a communications platform embedded across the whole of the trust and SLAM so that uh, clinicians can access um, advice and guidance easily uh, from colleagues in partner trusts. The, the physical health clinic, essentially an in-reach um, uh, physical health team to support uh, long-term condition management, uh, patients on, on the wards, hoping to avoid uh, their unnecessary transfers into uh, acute hospitals, you know, treating people where they want to be treated. A health champion study uh, where we paired uh, volunteers with service users in the community to support and work together on personalized physical health goals. Um, we conducted a, a service evaluation of physical health care in community mental health teams in SLAM. We looked at the barriers and facilitators of uh, delivering physical health care in CMHDs uh, and the digital study as well, which is um, a, a another one of our webinars, which looked at the technology that people are using, uh, uh, people who have a serious mental illness uh, and, and how they use that technology to support the physical health. 
So I think across the upcoming webinars, we'll go into some of our projects and work through more detail. Uh, uh, basically, we want to disseminate and share our learning, hopefully give back, uh, because by sharing our experiences and insights, uh, we uh, hope, uh, I think, to help others continue the mind and body approach. That's me. Sorry if I went over. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, and it, it's so key, I think, to be able to share with everybody just the breadth of work. And you said right at the start, it's so tricky to fit in uh, such a vast portfolio in just five minutes. So thank you for that. And Sean, also for your earlier reflections as well. Um, at this point, what I would like to do um, is move us on to the kind of heart of our webinar today, which is a panel discussion, uh, where we hope really to hear from key colleagues who have worked with us on the IMPS project over the last few years years. And I'd really love now to invite our panel members, Faith Smith, Helen Kelsall, Dr. Isabel McMullen and Dr. Julie Williams um, into the room. And of course, uh, to welcome our nominated chair for this panel discussion, Joseph Casey, uh, Director of Partnerships and Programmes at King's Health Partners, who's very kindly going to lead the discussion for us. Uh, Joe uh, and everybody, uh, I'll leave it over to you. Gracie, thank you so much. And um uh, Ray reminded us of the beginning of the pandemic. Can I check that you can hear and see me? Oh, so, yeah, can. Fantastic. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. Look, you're not here to hear from me. I feel very privileged to have been invited to chair this panel, a project that I've had. Um, I've enjoyed and had the privilege actually of, of hearing updates from the team, but really not being involved uh, in day to day. But luckily, uh, and Julie and Faith and Isabel and Helen, we're going to be speaking with the people that really have been driving this um, project. Uh, in the interests of time, I'm going to move us straight into uh, the questions that I have for the panel members. I'm going to try and keep us to time because I'm really keen to hear from uh, people joining the webinar, their questions uh, for the team here today as well, after the next 20 minutes or so of, of discussion. So, um, Julie, I'm going to come to you first, but I do invite all of the other panel members, um, please do ask your own questions of one another as we go through the discussion and we will uh, try and have an interactive um, conversation. Um, so, so, Julie, my first question for you is, so at the start of the project, how did you decide what to focus your efforts on and how did you approach that? Thank you, Joe, and hi, everybody. Lovely to be here today. Um, yeah, I think Ray's kind of covered some of that. Obviously, um, we had put a bid together to the Maudsley charity, and so there were things in there that we kind of knew that we wanted to do. Um, I think the way that we approached it was really um, very collaboratively, was even within the things that we had set out to do, we wanted to make sure that we involved all the kind of key stakeholders um, to make sure that that we were really meeting people's needs and that actually the way that we were going to do it was going to be successful. Um, and I guess, as Ray said, um, I work in the Centre for Implementation Science and my boss is um, Professor Nick Sebdali. So we were bringing a wealth of kind of implementation science expertise in. Um, and for people that don't know what implementation science is, it's, it's basically a way of kind of thinking, OK, we've got this intervention or we've got this way of working. How do we do this as successfully as possible, making sure that it, it works for, you know, everybody that's involved and thinking about things as, as Ray talked about. Um, and everyone in my team knows I talk about a lot is context you know you have to understand where people are and what's important to them to make anything work so I think a lot of what we were doing was was really about building relationships talking to people making sure that what we were doing actually was was going to be what people wanted us to be doing um, and I know that we've worked really closely with Helen um, in her role and Isabel has been with us and Faith, um, you know, helping us to kind of have those different points of view. So it's lovely to be on the panel with, you know, people who have these different experiences and different knowledge that have people have bought very, very generously to this project, I think. And I don't think we could have done anything that we've done without all of the people that have helped us with it. I don't know if I've answered your question, Joe, or not. Uh, it's really interesting. <laughs> and um let me ask you a follow up question. So you talked about working very collaboratively, building on the experience and expertise that exists within our partners, but across much wider um, experience to meet people's needs. I'm, I'm interested, particularly at the beginning, Consciousness was funded by the Maudsley Charity. 
How did this inform your approach right from the beginning, even before, I suppose, you'd secured funding and support uh, to take the project forward? Well, um, I'm not the best person to ask about that, unfortunately, because I wasn't there at the beginning. But I do know that there was a, a big, huge amount of work that went on um, with people like Sean, with Fiona Gochran, with Nick. Um, Isabel, you may have been more involved in these discussions that, that, than I was, I'm not sure. But I know that they did a lot of work um, to work with lots of different people. So, for example, the health champions, which we're doing the webinar on next week, that came out of a discussion with um, actually Kate Lily White, who was also our um, um, our our leader at the beginning, um, and she did a lot of work on this as well. And it was out of a discussion with Isabel um, and Dudu, who's the SLAM volunteer manager, that that actually came from. So I think you can kind of see from that that there, a lot of it came from talking to people on the ground about, you know, what what are things that you think would be helpful? How are, how could this project kind of support ideas that people have? Um, the, so the physical health clinic, I think, came out of a lot of the work that Sean and Fiona had been doing for years to try and get this set up. Um, so I think that's right at the beginning, that's kind of where it went. And I think what we were able to do was be flexible um, over the time of the project. And I would really like to thank our funders, actually, the Maudsley Charity, who were always incredibly supportive if we sort of said, we'd like to do this other project or we've got another idea. Um, also, we could be flexible in terms of, you know, obviously the pandemic happened um, you know in the middle of all of this and I think having that flexibility really meant that we could um you know do new things and change what we were doing in response to that um so that was I think a big strength of the project as well and and that definitely comes down a lot to funders yeah really helpful thank you Julie and, and Isabel I do have a, a specific question for you but perhaps you want to build on what Julie was saying there before I I, I bring you in on a broader question uh, yeah, I'm happy to, or I, I'm happy to, I mean, Julie's covered off quite nicely, um, kind of what we were talking about, about where the project came from and how it evolved and the funders. Was there something specific? I'm very happy to come in uh, now. Well, I'm doing the awful thing where someone chairing a panel throws you by yeah. asking, uh, not asking the question that we're going to discuss. Look, um, Ray actually has already mentioned this, and I think there's a kind of theme coming through this conversation already. <laughs> the word collaborative has been used a lot. And Ray was talking in the introduction about the range of different skills that have been brought together to deliver this project in terms of clinical, in terms of academic, but also project management. Interested in how you've used those areas to work together collaboratively, but critically to improve physical health for people with mental illness. Yeah, no, and I think this is so key. I was I was smiling wryly to myself when Ray was uh, giving his introduction, because as you say, the word collaboration was so important here. Um, and thinking about how clinicians, academics, and he named them as well, project managers all work together. And that's quite unusual in the NHS. I suppose something a bit about me and why I got involved as the medical lead on this project. So I'm a psychiatrist, but I actually work in liaison psychiatry, which is means I work in the acute trust, seeing people with physical health problems and trying to look after their mental health in a general hospital setting. Uh, in the emergency department on the physical health wards and what I've been thinking for years and years is that what we need is the flip if you like the inverse the the, the negative the, the, the kind of um, opposite of that so that we've got people looking after physical health in the mental health hospital settings and in the community so this really appealed but one thing you know it seems such a no-brainer when you talk to clinicians when you talk to anybody really and to our funders but what we weren't very good at doing was getting it from a nice idea that sound like it would make sense that it would make improvements for people getting it from nice idea stage to like actually implement it to a project that was delivering and improving things for patients and that's that this collaboration between these different professional groups has been absolutely key to this and, and Faith's going to talk about the patient role and the patient by experience role because this has been also really key you know we've talked about clinicians uh, academics and um, project managers but also you know experts by experience and so on um, so I think you know, how do we pull them together? Well, you know, much uh, cleverer people than me have been um, uh, involved in doing this. But I think what's been really uh, one of the benefits for me working on this project is that sometimes in the NHS, we're very good at working in silos. So, um, I, I, and actually the things that matter to me as a kind of jobbing clinician mm. might not be the kind of things that get, you know, that, that really get flagged up when you want to present something as a kind of, you know, do an evaluation of something. And that's where the academics have been really good at drilling down and saying, yeah, yeah, we know this is nice to have, but how are we going to show that it works? 
And that's been so useful, both in a challenge, you know, a nicely challenging way, but it's also, I think, helped us demonstrate, you know, not just this is a nice idea that we're going to implement, but actually, is it working? Is it effective? Uh, and similarly, project managers, I mean, I, I take my hat off to them, the ability to run an Excel spreadsheet and keep us on track and keep me to task uh, and schedule meetings and chair them and, and actually turn well, I'm, you know, our strengths, which is talking into kind of actual output has been tremendous. And it's been really lovely. This is the other thing that, you know, we can talk about outcomes and so on. But the other thing that's been really effective here is this kind of collaborative, to use that word again, working. Uh, I am going to ask you about um, outcomes and so <laughs> but let me just uh, reflect briefly. I mean, uh, I said at the beginning, it was a privilege to be part of this discussion. You just used the word lovely, and it really is lovely. And I think the ethos uh, of this project, but actually the, that collaborative approach to teamwork really comes across in, in how you're um, uh, describing the work together. I started with a difficult question. Let me ask you another hard question. So you, you mentioned outcomes. I mean, critically, this is about improving the outcomes that matter to people. So. I talked then about drawing and academics. What difference do you feel this has made to the outcomes that have been achieved? So that is a hard question. And that's because we've been delivering this in the real world. And this is where it's been really refreshing. And, and I am very guilty of using the word lovely too many times, but I really mean it in this project. It has been, I think it's because, and apologies, there's building noise, I don't know. Um, it uh, is something about the people working on this project have been genuinely wanting to improve things. So there has been that very supportive, kind, lovely atmosphere, if that doesn't sound too strong. But to go back to outcomes, you know, actually, why does it matter? What are we doing? It has been in the real world. Um, and and uh, somebody, uh, Julie, has already flagged COVID, you know, just literally pulled the rug out from under us. What we were planning to do had in most, I think just about all the work streams had to be totally rethought, rejaked. Um, but, you know, that's the nature of, 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 you know, clinical innovation, of delivering these kind of projects and programmes. You've got to be able to kind of roll with the, uh, roll with the punches. Anyway, you know, work in the real life. So how do you, uh, you know, evaluate outcomes in real world? You know, what you can't do randomised controlled trials. And from a doctor's standpoint, we like that kind of level of evidence. But this is why it's been so fantastic having the implementation science team working so closely with us. So what how and um you know what kind of outcomes matter to people i mean you know you can think about globally what do we want to do we want to improve kind of physical health outcomes really and integrate physical and mental health care a bit better might be working mainly on the work streams that have focused on the physical health clinic consultant connect so from ray's lovely uh, diagram trying to map everything out from the beginning those have been the wet, the main work stream that i've been involved in and of course it's a bit of a million dollar question. How do you prove down the line that we've improved people's physical health? It's very hard. There's so many like contributing factors. Um, but we've gone at it from a very mixed approach. So there's been some kind of economic data. You know, we've also looked at things like uh, emergency department attendances for inpatients in, in, on, on the Maudsley site, the Lambeth Hospital site, all of that kind of thing. And also talking to the kind of clinicians who are using it, the doctors and nurses on the ward, the allied health professionals providing training, really embedding services into that. The harder bit, I think, and if I'm allowed to be kind of totally warts and all and totally honest about this, is I think getting the end user or actually you know the people the patients the carers the families getting direct feedback from them you know has it actually improved things for them and for, for them in terms of their physical health care and i think that needs to be our next you know challenge in terms of closing closing the loop um in terms of kind of addressing that aspect of the out outcome measurement yeah, no, absolutely. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're uh, posing kind of hard questions to yourself. And I think one of the things we'll need to keep doing is asking those questions about outcomes. But perhaps this is a nice moment to bring faith in. And we've talked about that range of experience and expertise informing the project. And Faith, really keen to hear from you, your perspectives on how the IMPS project has had that commitment to involving experts with lived experience and working very much collaboratively in partnership together. From your perspective, in what ways did the team involve you in the project? What do you think worked well and why? Faith, I don't know if you're able to, um, you able to come in? 
I can't see you. Is that better? Know. Yes, that is better. Uh, oh, right, it sounds sorry. like you're having the technical issues that I feared I was going to have, but hopefully you heard <laughs> my question. I'm not sure if we can see you, but I can certainly hear you. All oh, right, I have put the camera on because I've joined on my iPad as well because I'm having this problem with the sound on my computer. So hopefully you can hear me now. I have Absolutely. got the camera on on the computer. Um, so when I think of the involvement, you know, as a carer, expert by experience, you know, I have felt part of the team and it's not just been, oh, you're here, so let's tick a box, we've got a carer on board. It's been listening to the kinds of things that I'm saying, the kinds of things that I'm gathering from not only my family circle, but from the wider people that I come into contact with. And it's about, you know, one of the kind of small things, it could be like the consultant connect. And I was really excited about that because I thought, gosh, if, you, if you've got a mental health issue and then you've got a heart problem as an example, you then don't want, oh, we'll see you in two weeks time. If you can get some kind of feedback there and then, or this is the intervention that we need, you know, that has been really, really key. And I have found that being involved, um, I have kind of said, well, actually, I think this is a better way of doing things, or have you thought about that? And it's just not thinking about the diagnosis, it's thinking about you know, all the work that is going on is actually comes down to someone's mum, someone's brother, someone's son, you know, a, a person, not just, you know, when you look at the graphs and you say, well, we've had a 10% reduction in, in violence, you know, and aggression as an example. It's not just about the figure, it's each of those dots mean somebody's lives and whoever that is, whatever goes on behind the scenes of what you can see, um, because why should someone with a mental health issue live a shorter life than someone who doesn't have? You know, I, you know, I sort of, I'm pleased that this is kind of coming to the forefront and that people are talking about it and that there is that chance to redress that balance and also to look at it in a more holistic approach. It's not just saying, oh, well, you know, we as clinicians think that this should be done, you know, as a, as a carer, I have been able to sit in our steering group meetings and put my hands up and say, well, actually, Sean, can I just question you on that point? And the questions have been answered. So, you know, it's, it's been, the, it, you know, it is a good experience for me. And to be able to see the different projects as they have been going along and having an input, even though it, it might not be saying, oh, this is all wrong. It might be just saying, well, I agree with that point, but when you talk about asking for feedback, how are you doing that? Is everyone online? Perhaps not. You know, are you know, offering a phone call? Those kinds of things so that people can, you know, respond in ways that suit them, that are applicable to them. Um, it's always important to ask Sean uh, hard questions and uh, I, I hope <laughs> you continue to do so. Um, you started to answer the question I was going to ask you, but if you could identify just one thing from your experience, what do you think other projects could learn from what you've just been describing there? I think other projects can learn from um, that, you know, we use the word collaboration. And for me, it may mean one thing and for someone else, it may mean something else, but it's to have a conversation, open dialogue, so that you actually, you know, you I was in a meeting recently and I talked about collaboration, but I did not use the word. So it was for the Reduce and Restrictive Practice Accreditation. And one of the things that the judges said was that you've talked about collaboration, but you have not used the word. So it's actually asking from the beginning we are thinking of doing this project. How can we involve you from day one? Not we've we've got this presentation. What do you think of it? I mean, as an example, with the report that's going out, we've had meetings with Julie and others where we've gone through and said, look, we need an easy read version. Yes, we need an academic version. And we have gone through that report and said, look, this this is too high brow. If you want people to read it, that's not going to happen. And so that is one example of the input that I feel that we as experts by experience has had. And that is something that other projects can take forward, communicate and bring in your experts by experience at the beginning. Thank you. No, Faith, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm scribbling furiously on my notepad to make sure that 
I'm learning from you in the projects and programs that we're doing across King's Health Partners. Now you talked about collaboration and it's important that I ensure that I uh, bring Helen in as well. I'm just about keeping us to time, um, which is often what a chair says when they're not. So Helen, in your role, um, you have responsibility for physical health, kind of keen to understand from you how useful it's been to have a team like IMPS working with you over the last three years. Thanks, Sir Joseph. Uh, I think um, what's really interesting for me is I'm um, a slight latecomer to the programme. So I was working for South London and Maudsley at the conception of the programme, and then I uh, diverted off in, into acute healthcare for a number of years. But what that enabled me to reconnect with was that the, the disparity is gross for our patient group and actually we have to have um, a strong commitment to reducing that like everybody else said on the call and I was just reflecting on on um, what Isabel said about outcomes and I think for me there is something about the intentionality of our actions that you often need at the start of a piece of work because there is a recognition that outcomes will come much further down the line. They often are longitudinal, especially when we're thinking about human beings really and people. People need time to adapt, change and accommodate. And, and actually for me with the IMPS team is that's something that they have demonstrated. They've been able to pivot, help um, redesign the programme slightly to support us to think through some of our challenges. So in particular, the project around talking to our staff, patients and carers about how they perceive um, mental health services role in physical health care has been really, really useful and has produced some very tangible recommendations, which we can then use as part of our strategy to drive forward our plan of work. Um, the IMPS team have given us the ability to create capacity in an already very stretched system um, and not only create that capacity, but en enable meaningful inquiry. So giving people the chance to really um, learn in a way that isn't just about ticking boxes. Um, the other, there are so many, the list goes on. Um, but I think that, that as part of that inquiry, and I've sort of referenced it already, but I can't stress enough that they've produced tangible, workable outcomes. So they're not abstract outcomes. So very much in line with King's Health Partners mission, of course, which is, is to get the, um, the research into practice to meet the needs of our people, which is critical and we, we are all people. Um, and so the, the health champions work some fabulous um, opportunities there for growth, stretch, embedding, and and getting um, a bigger a bigger team of people that are going to really enable our people that live in our communities to have personal agency around their health outcomes, which I think is vital in this day and age. Uh, they've created opportunities. So we've talked about collaboration, and the word that I'd thought when you asked the question initially was connectedness. So in my mind, when I think of a question or a challenge around physical health care, mental health care integration, I get this visual in my brain of um, these wonderful sky bridges between GSTT, uh, King's College Hospital in South London and Maudsley that I just walk across in my mind and speak to the IMPS team. So a really good example of that, if I could take the liberty of time, is um, after working in the acute sector for a while, I started to think, how are our patients accessing Desmond, which is a structured um, education program around supporting your lives with type with the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes? So I spoke to Ray, I got on that bridge, wandered across, had a chat with Ray, and he signposted me in the direction of the Recovery College at South London and Maudsley. And then through that process, we were able to have discussions about how we can increase capacity to that program and use some of the population health technology that IMPS have supported the development of to think about how we could make a more targeted um, offer to the people in our communities that need that care. So, yeah, I mean, I could go on. I really could. Um, and I'm well happy to. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the, the, the risk here is I think I could go on uh, and then I'm going to be told off and not invited back. So I'm conscious that um, 
I need to bring Natalia Stappen in for the next part of the agenda. So what I'm going to do with the panellists is firstly say thank you. Really fascinating. I think the start of a conversation really encourage people to put their questions in the chat. I'm going to leave you with a question to think about, which depending on um, if others want to come in, we might be able to come back to, which is for each of the panellists. What do you think are the key lessons here that other organisations, both across King's Health Partners, our local system, but actually nationally and indeed internationally could take away from the IMPS project? So I'm going to leave i'm going to leave that question hanging for you to think about and uh again just kind of thank you all for a really lovely but really impactful and i think important conversation as well and uh, natalia hopefully not too over time um i will uh, hand over to you hi thank you so much that was a really really interesting discussion um i'm the program director for the Mind and Body program. And I've just been asked to share some of my reflections on working as part of the IMPS project with a team and just think a little bit about what some of the opportunities for learning from this work might be. Um, but firstly, I just wanted to say my, ma my main reflection really is just how fantastic it's been to work with the IMPS team. And, um, and on the kind of IMS project. We've got a project here that's really quite broad and unique, and it allows us to kind of add to our knowledge base. It allows us to think creatively and strategically and test new and innovative ways of working um, and, and really work hard to hopefully have a positive impact on service users and staff. So it really combines all those uh, all those bits. Um, and I wanted to echo Sean's words um, and, and Julie's as well. And I mean, just say thank you to the team who have just done such an incredible, um, such a incredible work. Um, I also wanted to thank the Monthly Charity who made it possible. Um, and, and of course, all the SAM colleagues who have been, um, you know, supporting this work and, and championing it without, without whom we, we couldn't have, we couldn't have, um, you know, had the impact that we have had. Um, I think what really makes this project so unique um, and, and why I think there's so much learning um, to kind of to share from it is, you know, partly kind of what the project has delivered, but really coming down to, to the way that team has been working. I think it's that combination of a focus on the kind of co-design and close collaboration with experts by experience. I think that there's the really crucial kind of clinical and operational awareness, um, including by working closely with SLAM colleagues. Um, and, then, and then added on top of all of that is the academic rigor provided by our KCL colleagues. Um, and um, you can see a little slide here. I'm not going to. I'm going to try and not repeat what other people have said, but just um, maybe summarize briefly, kind of the approach that the team have taken. Um, so it kind of really always started with that scoping of good practice, but also meeting with um, people from elsewhere and getting inspired from good practice elsewhere, and not wanting to re reinvent the wheel. Um, because there's a lot of good good work happening across the NHS. Um, then, you know, really kind of from the start, really, it's followed by that engagement with service users and carers and staff to understand their needs and preferences, but also barriers and facilitators um, that might actually help to inform a new approach or a new way of working. Um, and then there's the kind of testing of a new approach. And importantly, making sure that an evaluation is built in and built in from the start. And then <clears throat> obviously the goal is to make sure that if something works well, um, we're able to sustain the benefits and, and, and make sure that that continues as part of business as usual. Um, Grace, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so that's kind of the way of working, but it's really led to some tangible outputs um, and you've got some of them outlined here I mean there's been over 2200 calls placed through consult and connect um, over 200 patients have received input into their care um, through the physical um, health clinic uh, we've had 48 participants in our health champions trial um, and we're also doing a lot of work to understand <coughs> the impact of all of this work so for instance, how many unnecessary referrals were avoided? 
um, which is which is important because that's quite disruptive to people's care. Um, but then also, where did advice change someone's care and improve someone's care that they've received um, in the mental health setting? Um, and then importantly, what was patient's experience of the care they received? And um, all of this isn't easy, but um, the, the team has, has been kind of working to, to try and do this as best um, as possible. So I think there's a lot of potential learning here uh, for people who might be interested in um, improving how we work and testing new approaches, especially. Um, so for instance, we've already mentioned kind of a lot of the learning around how we co-produce work with experts by experience. How do we embed evaluation uh, to make sure that we know that if something's working? Um, also testing different implementation strategies to know why something it seems to be working and, and try and kind of tweak things. And then, um, of course, we've also learned a lot through um, through testing a lot of the different interventions um, that we have um, we have worked on as part of the project. Um, over the next few months, we will be publishing academic papers. And when I say we, the team, of course, will be publishing academic papers that outline in a lot more detail our kind of approaches and findings and how we kind of went about it. Um, we will be writing a report that's a bit, you know, shorter, glossier um, on, on our findings, but also is pulling out specifically considerations for, for people who might want to kind of learn from it or try something similar. Um, on the next slide, we've got a list of our upcoming um, webinars. And so um, they just kind of go through our different um, interventions and projects, and they're an opportunity to uh, for us to answer any questions, but also hear people's thoughts and 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 learn from others as well. So uh, so that's just the schedule of the webinars. Um, and please please do join if if any of them um, pique your interest. Thank you, Gracie. I think do I hand back to you? Yes, thank you so much, Natalia. And um, just an enormous thank you to everybody who has been with us uh, throughout the course of this webinar this afternoon. Um, the time has completely flown. And, and I think it's been so valuable, really, um, uh, to be able to reflect with those that have worked so closely with us um, on what the experience has been like being a part of IMPS. And I think the biggest takeaway, one thing that we're all immensely proud of and hope to advocate and certainly want to continue continue promoting is this idea of being led by the people that are ultimately going to benefit from this work and wanting to involve everybody at every stage and being open and transparent about the work that we're seeking and striving to do and thinking together always about how we could do more and how we could do better. Um, so I think it's been so valuable to hear from everybody right back from the beginning with Sean and Ray setting out kind of what, what we've done and how we've done it. But our panel discussion also so fully describing in detail the, the, the real kind of value add and the bits that are often so so difficult to, to measure, uh, which is actually the kind of ways in which we work together. And it's 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 we don't want to underestimate the value of that. Um, and so I suppose really what we wanted to do at this very last stage um, is just offer a space to hear from you. Um, so uh, Ray and Julie, I think we were going to just offer you guys opportunity to come back into the room with me here. But uh, of course, um, it's an opportunity for you to ask any direct questions to anybody that's spoken here with us today, if uh, they're hopefully still in the room with us. Um, or of course, if there's anything else uh, that you'd like to ask us about the project or anything that we've shared. Um, so Henry, I'm just going to uh, turn to you just in case uh, there's any uh, comments coming through in the in the chat. Um, I think. Uh, if anything, it's been nice to see some reflections that are coming through um, from colleagues and, and people that have worked with us. Ellie as well, I see, has also shared some reflections, which is really lovely. Um, Henry, let's come to you. Sure, yeah. Um, it doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat as of yet, Gracie. We do encourage you, if you if you would like to submit a question, please do add that to the chat. Or um, uh, as Gracie mentioned, you can raise your hand as well. And you're welcome to... Um, turn your video on and and uh and ask it directly to um Julie and uh and Ray so yeah we'd really encourage, encourage you to um to do that if um if you'd like I just wanted to um if I may I think uh uh 
Joe uh, posted the question, actually, the, the question of the panellists and anyone on the call, what are the mm. most important lessons? I, obviously, I've already given a lot about how we've worked and some, some of my opinion. Hearing uh, what other people, the, the panel have said as well, though, has kind of prompted some more. And I think that, um, for me, one of, the, uh, one of the things I didn't mention as much um, is this thing, uh, which others have now said, is about outcomes and what's really important and how we're sharing that. And I, I always like to use examples. So the example I'm going to give is, um, well, I've got two, one of them from the Consultant Connect project, for example. Um, we, we went and spoke to clinicians and um uh, you know, we, we've done questionnaires and surveys, whatever, to finding out what, what's been useful. Um, and one of them put in that, you know, this uh, intervention, Consultant Connect in this case, uh, uh, that they kind of, oh, great, we've got this. But they didn't really realise just how useful things were until they'd left the organisation and they went to somewhere else that didn't have it and they were back to square one. Um, and... The, the second example I'm going to give is with the health champions, which is a, a feasibility study. Um, and one of the people I interviewed at, at, at the uh, end, um, there was a, a comment they made basically about you know, how um, without health champions, basically saying uh, health champions had changed their life. Um, now, I, I know that this, this probably will come through in our um, uh uh, academic papers and stuff but it's it's these small pieces the um that actually for me meant so much because it shows the difference and it's those bits that um uh, i think as uh, faith was saying earlier you know that they don't uh, get explained in, in the big spreadsheets um so i think for me yeah that was probably trying to capture that and trying to share it, it, it is something that i will be mindful of uh, in future projects Thank you, Ray. I, I, th I think you're right. I think it is about how we make whatever comes out of the work we do valuable, relevant, accessible and, and able to be able to facilitate further conversation. Um, I think it's it's really, really key. Um, Julie, just to come to you um, and to kind of follow on from that point from Joe, um, was there any other sort of key lessons that you, you felt particularly uh, that applied for IMPS that would be worth sharing? Um, yeah, and, and and I just want to say thank you to Ellie for what she's put in the chat, because I think actually that's really, really helpful because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a long way to go back to the beginning of IMPS and things have changed so much. But I think it's really true that, you know, when we, especially when it was mainly me, Ray and Ellie, um, we came from different places, we had different experiences, um, but we were all um, able to be really open and um, honest about kind of where we came from and what we wanted to be doing and and that really helped the discussion so I think it's something about who you have as part of the um, you know part of what you're doing and I think building relationships is really really key and in the research world we don't really talk about that so much we talk about the outcomes much more but actually I think one of the things that I've realized in this project is that if you don't build those relationships at all those different levels nothing ever changes because people you know people don't change unless there's a reason for them to change um, so I think that's one thing for me is just thinking about you know how do we involve as many people as possible in, in, in a me as meaningful a way as possible. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and I see um, Joe as well has just added a, a reflection uh, there in the chat, uh, just about what more we can do together as King's Health Partners to support the sustained impact and improvement delivered through the IMPS project beyond what we're doing. Um, and I think there's really something in that, um, which I think we we recognise even with those that have contributed early on, as you say, Ellie and others who, there's been so many people that have been a part of this journey. And I think it's really key for us to reflect on our lessons and maybe that's something we can take away to think about how we can do that beyond this webinar series um but i suppose really um we are coming to time um so uh, i should say at this point uh, just a huge thank you um really to everybody who has been a part of uh, the imps project overall but just of course today's webinar all of our speakers and guests and everybody that's been involved in the room listening in uh, and i know there's lots of people that couldn't join us today um so we're pleased of course to have been able to record the webinar today so that 
that you can hopefully uh, tune back into this if it is useful. Um, before we come to an end, though, um, I would like to just offer this slide over to you just to say, of course, do get in touch with us if there's anything that we've shared today that's a bit of interest, or if you'd like to know more. Of course, our webinar series is coming up uh, next week. We'll be doing Health Champions, which Julie uh, has been overseeing. Um, and I suppose really very finally, just to say, um, Henry has got a quick poll uh, that he's going to just kindly pop on screen. It would be lovely to know um, how you found this webinar, if it's been useful, um, and if you'd like uh, to see more of this, then we'd love to know uh, what's of interest. Um, and whilst that's going on, uh, I just want to say thank you all so very much uh, for your time and for your attention and for all of your, your interest for this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much.